to do their job. Okay. Now I have heard the cries of my people. I have seen my Christian apologists. I have seen them wrestle with the problem of slavery in the Old Testament. Oh, I've seen them wrestle. I've heard the cries of my people. And I got to say, there are apologetics on the subject. When the subject comes up, why, why does God condone slavery in the book of Exodus? The apologetics that I've seen thus far are pretty abominable. They're pretty terrible. You know, they try to circle the square in ways that just don't really work. Oh, you know, it was, uh, well, it wasn't indentured servitude, and it was only six years, and then uh, it was six years, and it actually was indentured servitude. It was very different from the South. It was very different from the type of... Yeah, okay, cowboy. <laughs> Give it a rest, because that ain't going to work. Because that ain't working. So lay it down on the cross. So... As far as I can tell, we still have an intellectual conundrum. Supposedly, holy God, flawless in his morality, flawless in his being, and yet we have the laws that he presented to the children of Israel with the pretty obvious flaw right in the center of them. They condone slavery, the buying and the selling of human beings. And we all know that the buying and selling of human beings is wrong. So how could this be a holy God and actually give supposedly perfect moral laws that condone, so that have a flaw right in the center of them? And terrible apologetics aside, let's see if we can find some, let's see if we can work out some actually good apologetics that have nothing to do with indentured servitude in six years and gobbledygook, but maybe potentially a real answer to the problem. So check it out. The important thing to understand about God, he has no material representation whatsoever. What does that mean? That means if God wants to express himself in the real world, he has to do it through us. Thereby dramatically limiting his possibilities of expression in the real world. Yes, God is omnipotent, technically. But insofar as he would like to express himself in the here and now, no, he is not omnipotent. He has, of his own accord, forever limited his power, forever limited his power in the real world because he has chosen us as the vessel. And he is limited by our capabilities and our imaginations and what we can perceive and what we cannot perceive. For example, let's take musical ability. Now, in theory... God would be able to produce the most beautiful music you ever heard, e infinite varieties of it, at will, without even thinking about it. Songs of angels and things that would make you, you know, weep with joy just for hearing. At will. But if God wants to demonstrate his musical prowess in the real world, he has to do it through a vessel. And usually a specific vessel, a la a Beethoven thereby dramatically limiting the possibilities of expressing his own musical prowess. He has, of his own accord, limited his own ability in the real world if he wants to express himself. First off, he's got to choose a person. Second off, that person needs to be trained in how to play music and raised up to play piano or compose or do whatever it is. And then finally and most importantly, God is limited by the imagination of that particular person. If that particular person can't conceive it, it cannot be born in the real world. Period. No matter how infinitely creative God can be, he has forever limited himself. If the person who is the creator in the real world cannot imagine it, it cannot be conceived in the real world. So where am I going with this? Some of you already see it. I'm not saying that this is the answer. I'm just saying this is a possible answer and a possibly really good, solid answer. Because now we go to the problem in the Old Testament. And we got a bunch of, we got a bunch of, uh, we've got God's chosen people, the Jews, and they are supposedly bring God's holy laws. Now, as many of you atheists have already pointed out, 
these are ignorant goat herders. And their leader is Moses. Now, Moses is not a god. Moses is not God. As a matter of fact, Moses is a flawed human being. Even a murderer. Yeah, if you go earlier in the story, he killed a god. So this is a murderer and a man and a flawed man at that. And the people through which God has chosen to reveal his perfect moral, his, his perfect moral law are ignorant goat herders at best. So it's entirely possible that God dramatically limited his possibility of moral expression in the real world when he wanted to actually make it really in the real world, bring it to life of his own accord. Just as, just as Beethoven was limited in his musical expression, these, were, these people were limited in their moral expression. Forever and always, they could not morally outproduce out where they actually were. Now I can hear some of the arguments already. Why would he possibly do that? Why wouldn't he just clear it all up? Because maybe that wasn't the point. Why doesn't God just shoot through Beethoven, you know, perfectly musical glory, so everyone goes, oh my God, it's God, blah. Because that's not necessarily the point. Maybe it wasn't too perfectly expressed in that particular part of the Bible perfect morality. Maybe part of the point was to allow some flaws in there. It could be. I don't, I, call me crazy. But I don't find it some sort, I find it kind of a very suspicious coincidence that the one obvious moral flaw that still gets talked about in the Old Testament, that God condones slavery, is the very moral flaw that almost destroyed the United States of America at its inception. I don't find that a coincidence, or I find that a coincidence that speaks something to me. What I'm trying to say is it's entirely possible that God, for the purposes of the Old Testament covenant, for the purposes of writing down the law in the real world, dramatically limited his moral ability to the vessels who were writing down the laws. Now, God does that in any other context. Why do you think he wouldn't do that in the Old Testament? And maybe the reason why he let it stand like that because what they got down on paper was good enough. It's not the point of the Bible. It's not the point of the morality of the Bible. If you're reading the Bible of the Christian, the, mora the moral point of the Bible is what Jesus has to teach you. And maybe it was perfectly it was perfectly good in the sight of God to leave a seeming flaw in the moral in the morals of the Old Testament. And maybe part of the point is to have smart people smarter and more moral than God read it and go, oh look, it's so obviously wrong. Maybe that is part of the point. And the joke is on you. That makes perfect sense to me. I I would imagine it doesn't make that much sense to you, but that doesn't mean that it isn't right. Or it isn't in the ballpark of right. Or, or we aren't heading out towards a true apologetics. So, I don't know. Potentially it's a start. Potentially it's a start.